At number 10, we have Green Lantern's Power Ring upgrade that allows the rings to communicate with the other Green Lanterns in the universe. This feature, added by the Guardians of the Universe, is a huge upgrade that gives the ring a major advantage. Although there has always been an emergency beacon offered as part of the ring's powers, this is only meant to be used to relay to other Green Lanterns in times of distress. The homing beacon is a fantastic way to bring all the powers of the Green Lanterns together at any time, giving them that extra support whenever it's needed. Or even aside from combat situations, this is a great power to allow Green Lanterns to communicate with one another about strategy to better prepare themselves in the planning stages. Considering there are plenty of Green Lanterns throughout the universe, it would otherwise be extremely difficult to ensure that everyone is where they need to be at any given moment. Pretty nifty. And an underrated ability if you ask me. At number 9 we have Sam Wilson's Captain America suit. This is a huge upgrade for this suit giving it vibranium wings, gatling guns, and a nice little clip for the shield right on his back. While Captain America's suit usually doesn't change very drastically over the years, it's pretty obvious that it's due to the fact that Cap is strong enough that he doesn't need to rely on his suit to help him. He's usually more of a leader with his most valuable assets being his military strategy and brute strength. But when he hands off the moniker to Falcon, the classic suit and shield get a huge upgrade. And not because Falcon needs the support of his suit, but because... Why not? I mean, Falcon has to have wings, so already a Captain America suit with wings is enough. But throwing those guns on it really brings the suit to a new level. And he still gets to keep the shield. I think a mortal retired Steve Rogers will sleep soundly at night knowing Sam is on the job with this upgraded suit. At number 8 we have Captain Marvel's Nega Bands. Although you may know Marvel's suit as already having the Nega Bands as part of the package, this wasn't always the case. Before he acquires them, he is still extremely powerful from being empowered by a cosmic entity named Zoe, later properly realized as Eon. He's able to fly faster than light speed, has superhuman strength, and is also able to teleport anywhere in the universe instantly. So it's hard to imagine how a suit upgrade would offer any sort of improvement, but it does. When the Nega Bands are added to the equation, Marvel is then able to travel between reality and the negative zone whenever he wants. But that's not all. At all. He can also absorb any energy that is coming at him be it a powerful blast from an enemy or even the energy of the sun. They are also capable of providing healing powers and increased strength. They even keep the wearer from requiring food, air, water, and sleep, which is pretty helpful. They do have their limitations though. They don't protect from drowning or gas-based attacks. And this actually leads to Captain Marvel's demise when he's inflicted with a poison gas by Nitro that actually gives him terminal cancer. But anyway, let's not get too dark here. These Nega Bands are a huge upgrade for Marvel and that's all that matters in terms of this suit. At number 7 is the Superman Godfall suit upgrade. Now, considering Superman's unmatched strength, he doesn't really have much use for upgrades in that regard, but this suit upgrade is all about the looks and the motorcycle. In the Superman Godfall storyline, Superman has lost his memory and is living in what appears to be a dystopian city called Kandor, alongside his wife Lila. It's a state we aren't used to seeing Superman in. He's got a job, working at a kitchen, and appears to be living a pretty human life, without even his secret identity needing to be hidden. And his costume is just... It's so cool and Blade Runner-esque with a Tron style motorcycle to boot. I mean, who doesn't want to see Superman having access to a motorcycle when he's facing off against dystopian villains? It's just a great reimagining of the character and the suit he wears. And I think it's a fair addition to this list. Upgrades don't always have to be based on abilities and features, you know. Looks matter too. Okay, at number 6, I'm putting Blade's silver armor from Blade Vampire Hunter from 1999. Taking a break from the usual mysterious green or black trench coat, this suit offers a whole new image for Blade. Now, I don't know if I'd say this is his best look ever, but I will say that it's a big upgrade in terms of utility. Having armor seems like a pretty obvious call for a vampire hunter from the get-go, so when I found the silver armor, I knew it had to make an appearance on the list. And the main reason why this suit ranks higher on the list is that silver is known to be a weakness for vampires, which are naturally a threat to a vampire hunter. 
This suggests that aside from the defense upgrade, this suit also gives Brooks a huge added advantage against his typical foes, on top of the obvious protective advantage. Even though it only sticks around for two years, this is a good upgrade for the character that offers much more protection than his typical garb. With a silver chest plate and silver gauntlets, this costume just gives Eric Brooks a more reasonable level of protection and sort of fits him into the category of superhero a bit more. At least in the traditional sense of how he looks. I still think it was the right move to bring him back to his original black leather jacket after the suit ran its course, but it is a good moment for Blade's armor in the grand scheme of things. At number 5, we've got a controversial one, Wolverine's Heated Claws. Although this upgrade is known to be slightly silly and short lasting, I think it's probably one of the best straight up upgrades on this list. It's not an attachment or an aesthetic update, but a good old fashioned upgrade of the pre-existing power. And it's Wolverine's primary weapon of choice, so getting to keep using the same old equipment except now it can heat up to extreme temperatures, that's pretty good. And what makes it even cooler is how the heated claws are formed. When Wolverine is resurrected from death, the excess energy left over from his body's healing process goes into his claws and brings the adamantium to extreme temperatures. Now remember, these claws are made of one of the most durable metals in the universe. So even though heated metal tends to soften, you shouldn't expect his adamantium claws to do the same. These things are driving right into any and every enemy like a hot knife through soft butter. Ew, that's a weird visual. But it's true, and not to mention, this dude just came back from the dead. So you can expect him to be pretty angry and ready to take it out on anyone in his way. Okay, at number four is the Iron Spider Suit. Now, this is such a huge upgrade that the word upgrade doesn't even do it justice. Now, if you've seen my list of the top 10 Spider-Man suits, you know that the hero has had many different suits and they are all useful in their own right. But this one is probably the most drastic change that the suit endures in the right direction. Designed by Tony Stark himself, this upgrade changes literally every aspect of the suit for the better. It gets these four spider legs with grips and cameras on the ends of them, allowing the wearer to use them to climb walls hands free as well as use the cameras to see around corners. He's also got the same internal HUD system as Iron Man's suit, giving him heightened senses using the computer's intel. Not to mention the sophisticated mask system that offers full filtration to keep him from facing a similar fate to Captain Marvel. And a gliding system, giving him more hang time between web swings. It's a huge upgrade to the suit that totally changes the game for Spider-Man and offers him a whole new set of capabilities with which to defend himself and to best all the bad guys. At number three, we've got Iron Man's Hulkbuster suit, which is an insanely powerful upgrade to the typical Iron Man suit, as you can probably already tell by the name. Now, just like Spidey, Iron Man has seen tons of different iterations of his suit, but in this case, this upgrade has a very specific function, to bust the Hulk. To fight the Hulk, yes. The goal is to get the suit to a point where it's ready to take on the Hulk. Otherwise known as Iron Man's Mark 44 armor, this upgrade gives Tony Stark all the tools he needs to take down a bad guy bigger than those he's used to. This thing has a missile launcher, a grappling hook, and something called automatic prehensile propulsion technology, which is basically a function that allows the armor to assemble on its own when it's called upon. And considering the Hulk's impulsive reputation, this feature would probably come in handy if the Hulk suddenly decided he wasn't on Tony's side anymore. On top of all this, he's got the built-in rams, which are used to add that extra oomph to Iron Man's punches. And if he decides that brute force is no use against the green giant, he's also got sleeping gas built into this thing. Although it's not super useful in the movies, this feature will definitely find its benefit at some point down the line if applied properly. At number two are Spider-Man's Web Shooters. I know this is the second Spider-Man upgrade on this list, but it's just a classic upgrade that must be mentioned. I mean, I would even argue that this is the ultimate superhero suit upgrade. And what makes this one really special is that it's the first time we're really shown how much of a scientific genius Peter Parker is. Sure, his character is established on the basis that he's very smart and proficient in biology, but this invention basically allows him to be Spider-Man. Not only does he design the shooters themselves, but he creates the web fluid, which is arguably one of the most useful and durable materials in the world. This list features plenty of upgrades that take an already powerful suit and bring it to a new level, but this entry is an upgrade that turns a guy with superhuman strength and reflexes into, well, Spider-Man. 
We all know about this one and it's almost seen as a given at this point, but it really deserves credit for what it really is and was at the time of its creation. A huge step into Spider-Man's career as a superhero. All right, at number one, we have the Batman Justice Buster upgrade, which ranks high on the list because once again, the word upgrade is a total understatement on this one. I break this one down in more depth than the top 10 Batman suits list, but basically this suit is designed to take on the Justice League. So every element of this suit has some sort of benefit against each of the members of the Justice League, giving the mortal Bruce Wayne an unmatched advantage against any opponents, not just the Justice League. Considering the suit he dons before the Justice Buster is just his typical costume, having a mechanized suit that has processors that work faster than the Flash can move is a pretty big upgrade. And besides the many features specific for taking down the members of the Justice League, this suit just has huge defense stats and attack strength that would help Bruce in any combat situation. Coming in at number 10 is Spider-Man with the powers of the Beyonder. For this point, we are talking about regular old Peter Parker from Spider-Man and Secret Wars number four, when he temporarily gains the powers of the Beyonder. Before Doctor Doom was granted the Beyonder's powers in Secret Wars, the Beyonder power actually went to two others. Once the power left the Beyonder himself, it actually went straight to Wolverine, who absolutely could not handle the power, so he almost immediately bestowed it onto Spider-Man. With this power, Spider-Man turns Doc Ock into plants, obliterates a big group of villains, easily rips apart Ultron, literally stomps on the Molecule Man, and defeats Galactus with his fists. He brings the city from the 32nd century into the modern day, creating new Parker City. He saves Uncle Ben on like three separate occasions, but then we learn that this all happened in like one billionth of a second, before Doctor Doom took the power back for himself, which was the way it was supposed to be. Number nine, Silver Surfer becoming worthy. If you want to see a whole whack of upgraded characters, then I send you to the Thanos Wins arc from writers Donny Cates and Jeff Shaw from Thanos Volume 2. Thanos goes to the end of the universe where he has become King Thanos, and in issue 16, a vengeful Silver Surfer shows up to take both of these versions of Thanos on after spending millions of years becoming the last being worthy of Thor's hammer, taking on a darker look imbued with black matter, calling himself the Fallen One, and gaining control over the Annihilation Wave. He shows up with the Annihilation Wave, hits both versions of the Mad Titan with massive blows, he one-shots a cosmic-powered Ghost Rider, he reverts the Hulk back into Bruce Banner, but somehow still gets defeated by King Thanos, who wields the Twilight Sword of Surtur, and then King Thanos and regular Thanos proceed to vicious bring the surfer to his end. Now I'm telling you, this story is absolutely bonkers, and to prove that, we will now talk about the number eight spot, Frank Castle with the power of the Ghost Rider and the power cosmic. Coming from the same Thanos comic just a few issues earlier in number 13, this version of Frank Castle comes from the future and he is quite literally insane. He shows up in the most bad way ever, causing a rain of blood before blasting through Thanos' army of Chitauri with Hellfire and riding this insane looking space motorcycle. It's quite beautiful honestly. He then traps Thanos in a chain made of the bones of Sidorak and using a fraction of the time stone, he takes Thanos all the way to the future to meet that King Thanos that we just talked about. This is Frank Castle, who was hit with debris and died during the final stand against Thanos on Earth in an alternate universe. Once Frank made it to hell, he made a deal with Mephisto to return to Earth for vengeance on the Mad Titan, but when this new Ghost Rider showed back up on Earth, everything was already lost. He was completely alone, and even Mephisto stopped responding eventually. This drove Frank Castle insane. Galactus eventually did show up, and Frank gave Galactus the Earth in exchange for being his herald and gaining the power cosmic as well as the Ghost Rider. These two spent hundreds of years together until the day they finally faced Thanos, who defeated Galactus with one fell head chopping swoop. Frank then became King Thanos' number one guy. He was such a great character that he even got his own solo series which you just need to check out. Number seven, Iron Man and Doctor Strange. So it turns out that Tony Stark is actually a good fit to become the Sorcerer Supreme as it has happened not just once but on two separate occasions in Marvel Comics. The first time would be in What If issue number 113 from 1998 where Tony and Stephen Strange meet at a party and after leaving together, Tony 
Tony is driving when they get into a car crash that ruins the doctor's hands. This leads Tony on a journey fueled by guilt to try and repair Strange's hands, leading him to the Ancient One and becoming the master of the mystic arts, but also learning how to infuse his tech and armor with magic to create a much more capable hero that is portrayed to Dormammu by Stephen Strange, who becomes almost like Baron Mordo. Now, the second time would be an all new X Men Annual Number no. 1 from 2014, which showed us Iron Man from Earth TRN 591, who brought together the Avengers to permanently end the threat of Thanos, which resulted in the alien races of the universe rewarding Earth with technology, making it a utopia, and Tony would start to lean more into his mystical side, becoming the Sorcerer Supreme and being able to solve conflicts without any kind of real fighting, and living youthfully comfortable at 126 years old, which is insane. And then the thumbnail for this list is also an Iron Sorcerer Supreme, but that is actually Stephen Strange with an Iron Man armor from Savage Avengers number 9 called the Iron Mage. And Savage Avengers Volume 1 is a must read, so you can check that one out for yourself. I'm moving on. Number 6, Hal Jordan and the Spectre. This point also gets to be a bit of a two in one, but this time we aren't looking at alternate universes. After the incredibly infamous destruction of Hal Jordan's home, Coast City, at the hands of Cyborg Superman and Mongol, Hal goes a little bit bonkers with his grief, leading to the Emerald Twilight story. Hal tries to create a hard light construct of the entirety of Coast City and the people that he knew who perished living in it, using all the charge in his ring that he had to do so. The Guardians of the Universe scolded Hal for irresponsibly using his power for his own personal reasons and demanded he report for discipline. But uh, the Guardians were the ones who were responsible for Hal not being in Coast City to save it in the first place. So Hal, all by his lonesome and absolutely insane, tore through eight of the strongest lanterns, taking their rings. He obliterated Kilowog, snapped the neck of Sinestro, and then he took down all the Guardians, drained the central power battery, and destroyed the Green Lantern core, becoming, or being possessed by, Parallax. He became a universal threat, attempting to restart the universe, but was eventually defeated by the heroes and sacrificed himself. But following that, he eventually became the new host for the Spectre, becoming God's vengeance and one of the most powerful entities in DC Comics for a time. Number 5, The Herald of Thunder. In the 2020 volume of Thor, written by Donny Cates, Nick Klein, and Matt Wilson, the god of strength and thunder has finally become the new all-father of Asgard. Yay! That on its own comes with a whole host of upgrades to his levels of power, but he does lose his arm and his eyes, so potential negatives there. Not too long after his ascension to the throne, Galactus comes in hot to Asgard, but not with the intention of devouring it like you might expect. Instead, the world devourer is running from the universe devouring Black Winter. This is the entity that destroyed the previous iteration of the universe and turned Galactus into its herald. So it's kind of a big deal. Galactus is freaked and he has learned that Thor will be the cause of his own passing so in order to keep the Allfather close, Thanos turns Thor into the Herald of Thunder which returns his arm and his eye, grants him with the power cosmic a huge power boost and gives him one of the most dope looks for Thor I have ever seen. Definitely my favorite. With this power, Thor was able to completely drain Galactus of his power he had gained eating five different planets and drain the power cosmic from the world devourer. Then he turned Galactus's body into a massive explosion that leveled the Black Winter to nothingness. Number 4, Wally West and the Mobius Chair. Wally West, as I have said a few times, is probably the most powerful person to be the Flash. He has a whole hell of a lot of feats to prove that, but he reached a whole new level when he first sat on the Mobius Chair. This artifact basically makes whoever is sitting in it completely omnipotent, basically meaning they know everything ever. But Wally isn't the first person to sit in the chair. Obviously there is Mobius who the chair is named after, but during the Dark Side War in the New 52 Justice League, Batman sat in the chair as well, and it was hella cool. But this is more than that. When Wally sits in the chair, it has been imbued with the energy of Dr. Manhattan. After Wally's involvement in the accidental passing of the heroes at Sanctuary, he was recruited to seek redemption. He removed all the invading dark matter from the multiverse, and in an act to save his kids, he sat in the infused Mobius chair. So now, Wally West, possibly the fastest being to ever exist, gained almost limitless knowledge and gained the powers of Dr. Manhattan, who can create life and manipulate molecules. 
He used the power to help defeat the Batman who laughs in the death metal event. In at number 3 is King Thor and the Phoenix Force. Yes, we are jumping back to Thor, but this isn't Earth 616 Thor. This Thor comes from the alternate reality of Earth 14412. His past is pretty similar to the 616 version of Thor that we know, even becoming All Father Thor after the War of the Realms event. But after that event, at some point in time, Thor leaves Asgard and joins Omnipotent City's Inter Deity Justice Department, which means he becomes a cosmic god cop. That's so cool! Basically, he arrested gods who would go and fight other gods. Gods. He would also become a planet at one point, then he had an affair with a frost giant and had a baby half giant son who then had three daughters, making Thor a grandpappy. He then went back to being all father, which is when Loki schemed to cause the complete annihilation of life on Earth, turning Thor into a big old grump. He would eventually help defeat Gore the God Butcher, restore life to Earth, and then all the way at the end of time, he encountered old man Logan who had the Phoenix Force and in a battle with a ghost riding, iron fisted, star branded sorcerer supreme Doctor Doom, Thor gained the Phoenix Force and fought Doom for 99 years before emerging victorious and going into the forever sleep. I hope that sounded as absurdly wild as it is because it's just insane. Number 2 Venom and the King in Black the King in Black is the cosmic divine ruler of the symbiotes, basically the god of symbiotes. The King in Black is the nexus of the symbiote hive mind. This means that King in Black can telepathically communicate with, dominate, and control all symbiotes in existence. Now previously, and for millions and millions of years, basically forever, the King of Black was an eldritch god of darkness called Null, and he was the one to first create the symbiotes out of the primordial void that existed before the universe was born. Well, he still got his butt kicked by a human. When Null finally attacked Earth, Eddie, Venom, and Eddie's son Dylan were crucial in the fight. The Venom symbiote broke free from Null's control and rebonded to Eddie and a new symbiote codex, incarnating as a gigantic version of Venom. On top of that, Eddie was resurrected by the god of light, Null's opposite, which transformed him into a cosmically powered version of Venom. Then, Eddie fused Mjolnir and the Silver Surfer's surfboard into a massive insane battle axe and used it to easily overpower Null and fly him into the core of the sun. He then became the new King in Black. And finally, in at number one, it's Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman seems to receive some of the most insane power boosts in DC Comics from time to time. Or at least, in their prime continuity, she has been boosted to insane levels three separate times. Now, For the purposes of time, I'm going to tell you only about one of them. Which marked Wonder Woman? When she was a child, Diana was marked by the goddess Hecate, the goddess of magic and witchcraft. This gave her a fraction of the goddess's powers, which lay dormant until the Witching War arc of Justice League Dark Volume Two, when it was activated by the Upside Down Man. Now, with this power, Diana revived everyone who got killed by the arrival and actions of the Upside Down Man, meaning she brought back Constantine, Bobo, and Swamp Thing, who shouldn't be able to be revived, just so that we're on the same level here. Diana could easily rip literal holes in reality, open portals, move entire mountains with a thought, and the whole of reality shook when she took a step. Zatanna said that Wonder Woman's magical power was like anything she had ever seen seen or felt before. Now eventually this power grew even further to the point that Diana was able to defeat the upside down man who was equal and opposite to Hecate in terms of power and then she set everything back to the way it was supposed to be. And that's all I gotta say about that. Coming in at number 10 is the Sentry plus the Void. The Sentry and the Void are two sides of an incredibly powerful coin. Sentry is like a more powerful Superman, as controversial as that may be to say. But in order to balance him out, there is the dark side of the Sentry known Known as the Void, who is just as, if not more, powerful than the Sentry is. It keeps his character interesting and doesn't make him the center of everything in the Marvel Universe. Well, in Century 2018, issues 4 and 5, these two opposing sides of one man become whole, and it is absolutely insane. Apart from looking so incredibly cool, the whole Sentry was able to completely whoop the antagonist of the series, Billy. Shapeshifting with black tendrils, withstanding energy blasts without a 
a scratch and altering reality in a small space to finally defeat his former sidekick. Then the Avengers show up with She-Hulk, Captain Marvel, Thor, Iron Man, Captain America and a whole hell of a lot of backup and they can do nothing to him or to stop him. It didn't last forever but it was an insane level of power contained inside one man. Number 9 Spider Hulk In the Immortal Hulk with Great Power story, Peter Parker is granted the alter ego of the Hulk after Loki magically transfers the gamma power to him. So it's Spider-Man with all his relative spider powers mixed with the unstoppable green monstrosity of the Hulk, matched up with all the temperament of a toddler that comes with it. It's actually really really cool and there are tons of hilarious moments in the story. Eventually the power of the Hulk is switched back to Banner with the help of the Fantastic Four and Banner's own genius. But it's a short little story that seems almost self contained but it's an insanely cool one and a spider Hulk would be an incredibly powerful character if he were to show up again and had more time to hone his abilities and his temper tantrums. Number 8 Spider Man and the cosmic comic. Sometimes Marvel will make a joke character or scenario and it ends up creating a character more powerful than any other character possibly ever. In How to Read Comics the Marvel Way issues 1 to 4, the comic itself becomes a character and it starts off trying to teach the reader how exactly to read comic books. The comic follows Spider-Man in a conflict with Mysterio who found the cosmic comic, the same one speaking to us in the basement of the Natural History Museum. It allowed Mysterio to free Spider-Man in time in a comic panel, turn inanimate objects to life and increase his size. Once Spider-Man gets his spider sense back, he realizes that the cosmic comic is influencing events and he grabs the comic, thinking it's one of Mysterio's tricks and tears it in half. After realizing the error of his ways here, Spider-Man and Mysterio begin trying to write their own comics to use the cosmic comic to make their comics become reality. That was confusing and I'm sorry. Thanks to the cosmic comic, they end up fighting across time. Time, altering history, and Peter learns of the fact that he is a comic book character. Seeing all of his comic book publication history, taking in all of this info, he then fuses together with the cosmic comic, basically meaning he can control reality within Marvel Comics, which I think is even technically more powerful than multiversal power. He prints the comic that he created, which has him save the day and win the battle, and it changes reality so that that's the outcome of the fight with Mysterio. It's nuts. Number seven, strange. Strange Visitor Superman. Okay, before we start on this point, technically this Superman is not canon, but he is one of my favorite versions of the character, and he is truly one of the more powerful versions of the character as well. In the story, Superman outlives everything in the universe, living for literally billions and billions of years. He lives so long and gets so powerful that he gains new abilities like being able to split himself into a thousand different copies that allow the hero to do what he does best throughout the universe. He outlives all the gods, cosmic entities, mortals, angels, demons, everything. He watches countless civilizations rise and fall and learns an insane amount of skills like telepathy. He absorbs ridiculous amounts of energy, learns magic and strange sciences through all his copies and then reabsorbs them at the end of everything. He can fly faster than the entropic waves of the end of the universe and can manipulate the fabric of reality through sheer strength. Number 6. Gambit. Now this really isn't an upgrade as much as it's an example of what Gambit could potentially become. Gambit's main mutant power is that he can take the energy of an object and convert it into kinetic energy and make it explode, essentially. His signature move is to do this with a deck of cards, which is really cool but on a side note extremely impractical, like he must spend so much money on decks of cards. Anyways, around the time of the mutant massacre, Gambit had begun to lose control of his abilities, which led him to Mr. Sinister, who removed a part of Gambit's brain in order to keep his abilities controllable. With an ability that seemingly lets him manipulate kinetic energy, Gambit could have been stupidly powerful if that part of his brain was not removed and we know that because of an alternate version of Gambit called New Sun, who has achieved the potential that Gambit could have reached. He can manipulate kinetic energy at a molecular level. He doesn't have to touch objects to charge them. He can use his ability on living beings. He can stop moving objects dead in their tracks or cause objects that aren't moving to begin moving. 
He can turn himself into pure energy that lets him travel into space and other dimensions. New Sun was able to defeat Dark Phoenix and he ended up destroying everyone on his own Earth. Now when New Sun confronts the 616 Gambit, 616 Gambit had restored his powers and it allowed him to fly, heal himself and even defeat New Sun. It's so cool and it doesn't really get to that level ever again. Number 5 Wonder Woman again. Gifted with the powers of the gods, Wonder Woman has many of the same abilities Superman possesses including strength, speed and durability. However, Wonder Woman's Amazonian training sets her a little apart as an amazing warrior. It's been debated for years whether Diana could beat Superman in a fight and while she's shown to be capable of hurting him at least, she doesn't have the same raw power. Instead, Wonder Woman dominates her opponents through a combination of her special abilities, superior tactics and special equipment gifted to her by the gods, but she has been elevated beyond that. When Diana was empowered with the World Forge and the Anti-Crisis Energy at the end of Doom War slash during Death Metal, she had enough power to shake stars and phase throughout time through sheer strength. She had displayed the ability to shrink an entire planet and was able to link everyone together and restored their memories as one history, as in all of DC's continuity. She has cosmic awareness, able to see multiple events during the war against the Batman Who Laughs at once, as well as precognition and retrocognition. She was crazy powerful for that short amount of time. Number 4 Dark Crisis Superman during the events of DC's Dark Crisis event, the main players of the Justice League were wiped out. While everyone assumed that they were gone to their graves, what actually happened is that each member was trapped in their own little pocket reality. Batman, Hal Jordan Green Lantern, Barry Allen the Flash and Wonder Woman were living in realities created by their own wishes and desires and weren't really aware of what was happening, except for Batman because he's Batman and Superman. When the other members of the League who escaped their pocket realities come to free Superman man, he is fully aware of the nature of his pocket reality and the already insanely powerful Man of Steel has become massively more powerful. Superman had tried to escape this reality countless times but he always failed so instead of putting that effort into escaping, he put his efforts into training himself and absorbing the cosmic energy of the pocket reality itself. He basically became what is basically a cosmically powered god and used that power to defeat the villain. Number 3 Emma Frost Lifebringer In the alternate reality given to us in Marvel 2 in 1 from 2018, instead of Reed Richards and the Fantastic Four saving our world from Galactus, it was actually Doctor Doom who did it and in true Doom fashion, he saved the world in a pretty evil way to ensure he would be powered up in the process. Although I don't believe that was what he was trying to do but you know, whatever. Instead of trying to destroy Galactus, Doom used a transference device to take over the world devourers body. The catch is that Doctor Doom was now driven by the same hunger that Galactus had and he ate every single planet in the universe, leaving Earth as the only planet left in the cosmos. Galactus gains more power as he consumes planets so as you can imagine, this Doom Galactus hybrid who consumed the universe is incredibly powerful and incredibly hard to fight against when he turns his hunger back on the Earth. A whole group of heroes band together to save the Earth but it's Emma Frost who makes the greatest sacrifice. Using another transference device, Frost transfers herself into Galactus kicking out Doom but also rewriting the core of Galactus's being and instead of devouring worlds, she sets out to restore the universe back to the way it should be with the immense cosmic power of Emma Frost Galactus Lifebringer. Number 2 Chaos King Hercules The Chaos King is a little bit glossed over when talking about incredibly powerful villains and I think that's because the story was focused around Hercules. Hercules is a cool character but from what I know, he hasn't ever really received the same kind of popularity as other characters in Marvel, especially with the character of Thor who is similar being godly in nature and incredibly strong but also just a bit kind of a lot cooler. But the Chaos War story was insanely cool. Basically the Chaos King, a universal entity of darkness, was able to defeat the gods of every pantheon and absorb their combined power. He also was powered by the souls of every being who had ever passed away in the whole universe from the beginning of time. He was extremely close to completely wiping out 
everything in the universe. In order to fight the Chaos King, Hercules gets himself imbued by the power of the Elder God, Gaia, and becomes an absolutely insanely powerful god of gods. He could teleport, fly, and emit energy blasts from his hands and eyes. He caused massive shockwaves and craters with every step he took. He very easily destroyed not only a Chaos King powered and controlled Zeus and Athena with one hit each, but the entire Council of Godheads itself as well. He summoned Galactus and the cosmic entity Eternity to fight for him against their will. He matched the Chaos King blow for blow at a size larger than a planet, and once the threat was gone, he restored every destroyed planet, realm, every being, entity, and god, and then he lost the power. And coming in finally at number one is Moon Knight. While Moon Knight is normally a regular old street level hero, the nature of his abilities, being the avatar of the Egyptian god Khonshu, means that he does have the potential to become ridiculously overpowered, which he does in the Age of Khonshu event. During this event, thanks to a super moon, the normally relatively low powered Moon Knight defeats the Iron Fist Danny Rand and uses an Ankh to steal his Iron Fist powers, which he then takes to the Sanctum Sanctorum and punches Doctor Strange using another Ankh to steal the power of the Eye of Agamotto. He then steals the car of Robbie Reyes Ghost Rider, which he takes to Wakanda alongside an army of the dead to take the powers of Black Panther, which fails, but then he ends up facing Thor, steals his hammer Mjolnir, beats the snot out of Thor, and since Khonshu is the god of the moon, he summons a bunch of moons from different places in space and traps Thor between these giant celestial bodies. Now, the whole reason Moon Knight is doing any of this is because Khonshu told him to in order to defeat Mephisto in order to save the world, which Moon Knight easily does using an amped up Mjolnir to rip a hole through the Hell Lord. Unfortunately, Moon Knight is kind of forced to do the bidding of Khonshu, who now takes the power and uses it to essentially conquer the world. Since Moon Knight is a hero though, he eventually gets himself empowered by the Phoenix Force in order to face and defeat Khonshu himself. It was an insane story, and he even considered completely wiping out humanity at the end, but luckily did not. At number 10, we've got Aquaman. Looking specifically at the redesigns that occurred between the Super Friends era and the 90s look, there's no arguing that the Super Friends look is pretty corny. Some would say that any redesign would have made it better, but what went into making Aquaman go from looking like this to looking like this was a decision that not only changed the way we saw Aquaman, but how we knew him as well. Firstly, the original look has him extremely clean looking, like he's been untouched by any battle, which we all know isn't true. And maybe that's just how superheroes were illustrated back then. But the 90s look has him with a harpoon for a hand, no shirt, and this sweet metal chest piece that just makes him look like he's really from the depths of the ocean. His trident also has a major redesign here that gives a more menacing look, like it's really designed to do real damage. And maybe it's not quite part of the costume, but the long hair and beard just seem like the right choice for Aquaman that should have been a thing from day one maybe. But maybe that's just me. Number nine, the Hulk. Now, this isn't exactly a redesign, and I'll give you that. It's more like a mistake. It's a mistake that led to one of the most iconic characters for Marvel. When the Incredible Hulk first appeared in Marvel Comics, his skin was actually a gray color to keep him indistinguishable from any real world race, as Stanley wanted. But an issue with the colorist's ink actually led to the character coming out looking green, which, I mean, you still get the desired effect. Stan actually ended up liking the green more, and they stuck with it. Good call, Stan the man. We miss you. Narratively, they even gave a reason for this. At first saying it was prolonged gamma exposure and later saying that Grey Hulk was an alternate personality version of the Hulk. At number eight, we have Wolverine. Wolverine's costume has had many changes over the years, but the change from the original yellow look is a significant design choice in the right direction. The thing is, Wolverine looks pretty cool in the original X-Men uniform, but something about this darker look feels like it complements his personality more. The red eyes and the black gray tones in this outfit are so cool and much more menacing than the classic yellow tiger stripe design, which, reflects what X-Force stands for as well. X-Force is a mutant organization put together by Wolverine himself, which applies lethal force if the mission calls for it. It makes sense that Wolverine would be behind something like this because of his inherent Machiavellian outlook on life. 
This character has lived for so long and through so much that his jadedness has become a staple to who he is. And this redesign just strikes me as being a more accurate portrayal of who Logan is behind the costume. Number seven, Drax the Destroyer. Thanks to the MCU, it's really hard to think of Drax the Destroyer in any other way. But the MCU's depiction actually borrows from the redesign of Drax from 2004. For this though, Drax here was, well, he had a cape. Capes are cool, no doubt, no doubt, but um, I mean, he's just so much better now. Take a look at his design when he was first introduced in the 1970s. Bright green skin with a very comic booky purple costume. It was unique, I'll, I'll give you that, but as the rival to the mad titan Thanos, it's just nowhere near as imposing and intimidating as it should be. The 2004 design with the pale green skin, red tattoos, and knives evoke the kind of strength and power that comes from the title of The Destroyer. At number six, we have The Flash. Looking at the Jay Garrick Golden Age Flash, we can all agree that there was room for improvement. Need I mention the elephant in the room? The silly hat? Okay, I know it has sentimental value, having been his father's World War I helmet, but it just doesn't look very cool. I'm sorry. And he would like, he would use it as a weapon by throwing it at bad guys? Anyway, I'm just roasting him now. But when Barry Allen is introduced in 1956 with a new outfit, it seems like it was always meant to be that way. His helmet is replaced with a mask and the little lightning bolts stick around, which we're happy to see. This costume then basically remains untouched until today, having undergone a few redesigns that didn't really stick, like Kid Flash, which I don't know. It doesn't do it for me. And the John Fox look, which once again, I don't know if it's the right decision for the character. I think the best place the design has found itself is Wally West's costume, which just gives the character a sleek look with lots of integrity. Number five, Lobo. Okay, before you jump on me in the comments saying he's a villain, he's more of an anti-hero, okay? When Lobo first appeared in DC Comics, well, he looked like poo. You were more likely to laugh than to think he had any kind of strength going for him. He had an orange and light purple skin tight suit for Pete's sake. But when he reappeared with his biker motif, it just made sense. Ripped jeans, leather gloves and a vest. With all his craziness, foul language, weapons, and spiked hair, he needed the rest of him to match. And I think we can all agree his iconic hook was definitely a worthwhile addition. Let's just forget about his newest New 52 redesign though. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> At number four, we have Iron Man. This is one of the biggest redesigns on the list and for good reason. The old Iron Man is made to look like he's literally wearing a big suit of armor that Tony Stark would like crudely bolt himself into. But over time with the way that the character's abilities become more advanced, so does the costume. It gets sleeker, more form fitting, and the colors are toned down a bit making for a more realistic look tonally. Something I noticed that's a real eyesore from the original look is the design of the face. The original eye holes and mouth make Iron Man look kind of soulless, like there isn't even a person in the costume. And sometimes that was actually the case, but as Tony Stark's storyline is refined, it seems as though his costume gets less and less blocky as well. And this wasn't only the case for Iron Man, it was arguably the case for every other hero in this list and beyond. With comic books getting more legitimized over time, the depth of all the characters expanded, allowing for cooler, less fantastical designs that you might actually be able to imagine seeing in the real world. Number three, Spider-Man. This is an arguable point. Spider-Man's red and blue classic suit is extremely iconic, and I don't think anyone thinks it's bad. The Sam Raimi version of that suit is, it's beautiful. But if you tell me that you dislike the black Venom symbiote or the black cloth version of this suit, one, you're a liar, and two, we can't be friends. This suit was actually designed by a guy called Randy Schuler for a contest Marvel had and they paid him $220 for it. I'm not sure how that compares to today, inflation wise, but that $220 bought the Spider-Man's greatest designs outside the original. So great, they even came up with excuses for him to wear it after getting rid of the symbiote version of it. Okay, at number two, we have the Batman costume designs from the movies. This is a big one that I think a lot of people agree with. Looking at his original look from the 1966 Batman uh, TV show and the redesigns that took place 
place to get to Christopher Nolan's designs for The Dark Knight, it's clear to anyone that these were major steps in the right direction. Although the original look was probably meant to be a bit goofy, it still could have looked a little less like pajamas and still gotten the feeling across. This is an important transformation to analyze because Batman's original outfit speaks to how seriously comic books were being taken back in the 60s, and that was not. Not very seriously. Honestly, Adam West looks like he pulled a $10 Batman costume off the secondhand shelf at a Halloween store in November. I mean, it barely looks like the cowl fit him. And then, when we were blessed with the Dark Knight trilogy back in 2005, we were reminded that these days, Batman is a serious character that, deser that deserves a serious look. His suit got darker, more slick, and it finally looked like real armor, which makes sense for the subject matter which has, over the years, gotten much more gruesome and violent. This was an essential redesign that demonstrates not only how far Batman has come as a character, but how far comic books have come as well. And the massive success of the Nolan trilogy suggests that people were ready for that change. Number 1. Carol Danvers The original Carol Danvers Miss Marvel costume is so incredibly different from her redesign as Captain Marvel that you'd be forgiven for thinking they were different people at first. Her Miss Marvel costume was characterized by a black leotard with a big yellow lightning bolt, bare legs, and black boots and gloves. While being an iconic costume, knowing what we know of her backstory and looking at the tone and personality of her character, it didn't seem right for Carol Danvers. When she jumped on the scene with her red and blue pilot-esque Captain Marvel uniform with the shorter hair and the star emblem, she exudes the confidence and strength that her character demands. She even still kept the red sash belt thing, which was probably my favorite part of her costume. This is the suit that inspired her MCU costume with not a single trace or mention of her Miss Marvel suit. It is also the suit that almost everyone has gotten to know her by and has completely revamped and reimagined her character. Number 10, Superman. This version of Superman, the one in the Kingdom Come story by Mark Wade, with art by Alex Ross and Mike Carlin, is set in an alternate reality, Earth 22. Meaning, it isn't a baseline redesign for the character. For that matter, it isn't even a complete overhaul of Superman's costume. The only difference they made to the costume was that Clark's hair had silver streaks to show his age, and the yellow parts of his emblem were changed to black. Otherwise, his costume was a very classic Superman getup. But those two little changes, plus just the overall style of the art itself, did something to this Superman that for me, it just makes, it just makes me tingle, you know? Number nine. Daredevil. When Daredevil first came out on the scene in 1964, his look was different from the one most readers are used to. Instead of his normal color scheme, Daredevil instead had a predominantly yellow suit, with only parts of the suit being the familiar red color. Now, in my humble opinion, the yellow and red suit has its own perks. The overall design of the suit is fairly similar to what would come later. But I will agree that when he showed up in Daredevil number 7 with the all red suit, courtesy of artist Wally Wood, it was an instant stick. It was more in keeping with the darker, brooding, street level nature of his stories. And it stuck for, well, pretty much the rest of his publication. Hey guys, before we go on, I just want to say a quick little thanks for watching. I also want to say thanks for those of you that leave comments below. I read a lot of them, and you guys always have interesting and helpful things to say. So thanks. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I won't forget to get on with this video. Number eight, the Punisher logo. Okay. I want to talk about this one for a couple of reasons, but let's just say it. Straight up, it's controversial, which always makes for a good discussion. Basically, the classic Punisher logo that has been around since the 70s got a bit of a redesign this year. Punisher has joined the hand, and in doing so, he has changed his logo to resemble that of an Oni. There's also reason to believe that the symbol may reflect his status within the organization. Unfortunately, there is also a real world political reason for the change. The logo itself was being adopted by real world police officers, which is kind of odd considering Punisher is pretty anti-authority, and was even worn by some of those who were involved in the Capitol riots, leading Marvel to make a politically motivated change. Love it or hate it, it is the new look for the character right now. I'm not totally opposed to it, but I know at least a few of you guys out there are a little upset. Let me know what you think below. Number seven. X-Men. I don't know if you know what the original costumes of the X-Men looked like back in the day. Yellow and dark navy blue with yellow and black boots and gloves. Except for Beast who was still vaguely human and didn't wear boots or gloves and Iceman who was more like Snowman. The matching costumes definitely show that this was a team even with their different and unique mutant abilities. There have been many iterations of X-Men costumes since, but for me, 
When the characters themselves got their own individual costumes in issue 39 of the comic, that's when they really came into their own. The leader of the team, Cyclops, has generally used this look and variations on this look ever since. Mostly. The other members took a bit more time to find iconic looks, namely Angel and Beast, who eventually got his blue fur. Number six, Star-Lord. When Star-Lord showed up in Marvel preview number four, he was a far cry away from what most fans have come to recognize him as. I think he kind of looks a lot like Owlman from the Watchmen comics to be honest, but even Peter's personality was much different. The tagline on the comic was, he stalks the galaxy, one man on a mission of cosmic vengeance. That doesn't sound like the typical wisecracking, sarcastic young hero we know today. Even before Chris Pratt took on the character, Star-Lord was revamped in the 2006 and 2007 Annihilation event, where he formed the Guardians of the Galaxy and got an incredible new costume change. Ditching the more cow-like headpiece for a full helmet and the skin-tight outfit for a more loose-fitting uniform. It just gives his character a much more distinctive look, in my opinion. Number five, Green Lantern. Technically, this point can be argued with. This isn't so much a redesign as a wholly different character, but ask anyone who isn't deeply knowledgeable of the comics, who the original Green Lantern is, and you're likely to hear them say Hal Jordan. Now, I'm just guessing here, but I think that has a lot to do with the fact that Hal Jordan's look, compared to the one of Alan Scott, it's just so much more iconic. Alan Scott sported a black cape with a red collared top, green pants, and a sweet normal looking belt. Sure, he is a different character and not technically an official Green Lantern, but when Hal Jordan came in with a green and black suit with hints of white, it just stuck. Let's just not talk about the movie version, okay? Number four, Robin Damien Wayne. We talked about Batman in the last video, so it's only fair we talk about his ward. Specifically, I wanna talk about the costume of the newest Robin and Batman's son, Damian Wayne. If we go back in time and look at the classic original Robin's costume, well, let's just say it kinda goes with the costume of the Cape Crusader at the time. In other words, it's incredibly impractical. I'm also thinking the bare legs wouldn't bode too well in the streets of Gotham, but that's just me. The costume was evolved over the years for sure, but the one that Damian wears when he appears as Robin in 2006, it's just like, ooh, I like it. You know, it's kind of hard to get specific on what makes this one so much better, I'll be honest. But if we just slap up some comparison picks, I mean, it, it's just better. Number three, Ultimate's Hawkeye. The Ultimate universe in Marvel sees a lot of changes to character designs that honestly kind of reflect the MCU looks just a little bit. Overall, I think the outfits are improvements on the originals. I wanna give a big nod to Ultimate Thor. But I think the best of the character overhauls would have to be Hawkeye's Ultimate Universe costume. The black vest, the crew cut, and the red glasses make him look even more like a secret agent, which he is. It's also a bit edgier and darker than his 616 counterpart, which most of the Ultimates are, considering the comics were aimed at teens. Fight me in the comments, but I definitely prefer this costume. Number two. Batgirl. Batgirl first appeared in Detective Comics 359, sporting an all-black costume with a yellow bat symbol, belt, boots, and gloves. Personally, I didn't have much of a problem with this look. I thought it was simple, for sure, and quite basic. Just like the other members of the Bat family, Barbara Gordon also got a ton of redesigns through the years. But in 2014, when she got a redesign, thanks to artists Cameron Stewart, Brendan Fletcher, and Babs Tarr, the new look, much like Damien's Robin suit, just made more sense. The costume was much more practical. More of a jacket kind of design with a removable cape. The belt was more casual, more like a holster design. Her design had much more personality too, this way, which really works for the character herself, who also has a strong personality. Number one, Nightwing. Nightwing first appeared, after leaving the Bat family, in Tales of the Teen Titans, volume one, number 44. And his costume was, honestly, not too bad. It was goofy for sure. Don't get me started on the collar, but with those gold wing designs, it was pretty cool. I'd be a fool though if I didn't say that the blue V costume that debuted in 1996 is the best suit that character has ever worn. If we don't take into account his newest DC Rebirth suit, which is basically just a slightly updated version of this one. The simple blue bird across the chest and into the arms mixed with the rest of the suit being black. Yeah, it's a simpler look, but one that ultimately works better than any other. Number 10. Nova. All right, starting off our little list today is going to actually be more of a different version of a character of the same name rather than a redesign. There have been multiple Nova Primes throughout the history of the universe. 
Richard Ryder is absolutely the main one and he is fantastic. I absolutely adore his Nova Prime costume. But when we first saw Samuel Alexander in point one number one in 2011 sporting the black Nova helmet, I'm sorry, it just did something special for me. I really enjoy it. Granted, being a younger, more slender guy, he doesn't exude the same kind of power that Richard Ryder does. But that doesn't make him any less powerful, and it doesn't make his costume any less impressive. Also, Disney, if you're listening, let me play Samuel Alexander, please. I want to wear his costume. Thank you. Number 9. Beast We mentioned in the last video the way the X-Men uniforms were all essentially variations of the same costume. Hank McCoy was a shorter, stocky guy. He had huge hands and feet, and his original costume didn't even have gloves or boots, which helped him to stand out even more. Hank was the bruiser on the team for sure, with his mutations being strength and agility. But while he may have been a somewhat odd looking guy, he was still fairly human looking. That is, until Amazing Adventures number 11 in 1972. Hank got a job at Roxxon, Basically, where he developed a serum that acted as a catalyst for activating latent mutations for short periods of time. And then he drank it. The effects of this serum ended up making Hank grow gray fur. His muscles expanded, his ears became large and pointed, he got claws, and his canine teeth grew and became fangs. The serum further increased his superhuman agility, endurance, speed, and strength, as well as enhancing his senses. In Amazing Adventures 14, his fur would become blue thanks to Quasimodo, and he's been the same ever since. Whoa, 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 slow your roll there. I gotta talk about how great you are. Every time you like and subscribe, it sends a ripple through the YouTube algorithm that makes this channel look just a bit more attractive. So thanks for doing that. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook as well, and I'll carry on making this video. Number 8. Scarlet Witch Now, I don't know if everyone's seen the WandaVision show, but it's definitely one you should check out if you are a Marvel fan. One of the best parts, at least for me, was seeing Wanda Maximoff get a new look. A look that pays homage to the origins of the character, but embraces a modern design, and just makes her look like a total bad which I think most of the fans out there have really been craving. Her powers in the MCU haven't always been all that they potentially could be, even though she outclasses almost every other hero in the MCU. But moving forward, I think we are definitely starting to see her break out of the shell, and this costume really embodies that. I am so excited to see her in the Multiverse of Madness. She is gonna be sick. Number seven, Deathstroke. We always gotta include at least one morally ambiguous character on these lists. But, at least this time, it's when he was actually acting as a hero. When Deathstroke was the leader of a superhero team, Defiance, he wore an awesome black and white costume. But not only did this costume change up his color scheme, he actually got a cape! Edna Mode would not approve. His black and orange color scheme is definitely a classic, and I'm not necessarily saying this is better, but I mean it comes extremely close. It's better. And the story it belongs to is it's such a good one. Check it out. Number six, Superman's black costume. All right, here we go. Look, he may have a mullet, but Superman in a black costume? I mean, come on. After the Man of Steel was resurrected in Superman Volume 2, number 81, after his death at the hands of Doomsday, he came back with an all black costume with silver symbol and wrist gauntlet type things. I don't know about you guys, and I, I know a lot of people hate that mullet, but you put any hero in black compared to their usual color scheme, and I'm here for it. The costume would get a revamp in the Justice League live action movie when Henry Cavill comes back to life, and it looked even better there. It may not have lasted too long, but I think this costume has a definite place in my favorite alternate superhero costumes. Number five, Monica Rambeau. When Monica Rambeau showed up in her costume in Amazing Spider-Man Annual number 16, it was a statement. I liked it, honestly. It was simple and unique. I don't really like the underarm wing things, they were kind of weird, but ultimately it worked for the time. She has been around for a long time, being part of the Avengers, Next Wave, and the Ultimates. But it was in the Next Wave number one where I think she got the best addition to her costume. All it took was a coat, and she instantly became so much cooler. 
The color of her under costume changed a bit, which it consistently does, but the jacket has now become a staple and every time she's wearing it, I am swooning. Number 4. Red Hood When Jason Todd was killed by the Joker in Death of the Family, it was a huge thing. It was heartbreaking. It was brutal. It was visceral. Six months after his death though, he was resurrected and he was restored by Talia al Ghul in the Lazarus Pits. He would join and be trained by the League of Assassins, eventually leaving to pursue justice, although a bit more brutally than before. Enter the Red Hood and an absolutely awesome new costume. Inspired by the original Red Hood costume worn by Joker, Jason's Red Hood costume is so much better. It's menacing and tactical and badass. I think I have a thing for jackets because, again, I love the frickin' jacket! Number 3. Batgirl Cassandra Kane. Okay, look, we talked about Batgirl in the last point, but we were talking about Barbara. If we want to get really into Batgirl designs that will knock your socks off, we don't have to look any farther than Cassandra Kane. Cassandra is the fourth Batgirl, and she is the daughter of David Kane and Lady Shiva, two assassins who raised and trained Cassandra to become the perfect warrior. She became the new Batgirl in Batman No Man's Land, and let me just say, if I was walking the streets of Gotham and I saw someone dressed like this, I would just move, like to a different city. It's so fitting for her, it's intimidating, it's intense, and if I was a criminal, it would give me nightmares. Number 2. Blade When Blade first appeared in Tomb of Dracula number 10, he had an interesting costume choice. Blade sported a collared jacket with a bandolier armed with stakes, riding boots, and let's not forget the super sweet yellow glasses. More of like a cool pirate with yellow goggles than a vampire hunter. He would have different variations of the costume. One that was actually pretty good was when he wore green goggles, a purple jacket and matching boots, green trousers and a yellow belt. But in Night Stalkers number 1 in the 90s, he finally showed up in the leather, sporting a leather jacket, all black clothing with the katanas. Of course, this was born out of the 90s, but it stuck. It has evolved over the years, but the key things introduced have stayed. The leather. The leather stuck. Number 1. Storm. The X-Men Storm is one of the coolest looking characters in Marvel Comics, for me. And that fact only gets reinforced in the Marvel Dark Ages number 4, when she shows up in a Wakandan inspired gold and silver costume. It is absolutely stunning. Storm herself is an extremely fashion heavy member of the X-Men. She changes up her look often and it's usually in unique and awesome ways. Like I really, really liked when she had the mohawk. But this Wakanda costume just takes the absolute cake for me. It calls back to her original costume from the second Genesis X-Men, but it's regal as hell, which it should be when she's the queen of Wakanda. The designs are amazing, and if I saw her show up like this, I'd believe she was a goddess too. Number 10, Loki. Loki has shifted so much in comics. He's technically a different character from that original Loki that first appeared in Venus issue number 6, and again in Journey into Mystery issue number 85. Loki's look originally was pretty silly, especially if we're talking about trying to adapt that look to the big screen and make it look menacing. We do get a version of that sort of original costume in the Loki series when we see an older, bitter, and and sadder Loki, who actually more reflects that original costume, and that original Loki. Loki now appears to look much cooler in the comics, and is also much more versatile when it comes to their style. This has also translated to the big screen where Tom Hiddleston's Loki has also gotten more and more dapper and stylish as time has gone on as well. At least that's how I see it. Number 9. Harley Quinn I know people love the original costume, so this might be like kind of a hot take, but I personally think Harley has had so many amazing costumes and looks over the years that have just improved on what was already, well, good. I'm not saying the original costume was bad, to be clear. So yeah, I'm not saying the original costume that she had was at the level of mm, some of the other ones on our list, <laughs> Loki, <laughs> being too much, you know, or too ridiculous, but I am saying that I think her design has only really improved with time. It's a compliment, Harley. Take it. Of course, not all of her looks have been winners in comparison to that original look, but I do think that her current outfit has definitely been one of her best that we've seen so far. And then of course there is her whole Birds of Prey look, looks, which I loved, and her The Suicide Squad DCEU look, which seems to have been inspired by more modern Harley Quinn comics and video game designs. And to be clear, we're talking about James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, not not Suicide Squad, not David Ayer's Suicide Squad. Those are, 
Those are two very different looks, are they not? <laughs> and friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to hear about some more cool super villain redesigns that we love, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, the Joker. The Joker is another character who has come a long way when it comes to his different looks. While his iconic face paint has remained, he's had many different outfits over the years and many different iconic pieces that we would identify as being part of his costume. Purple and green remain the Joker's colors, but instead of wearing a suit with like a ribbon looking tie that kind of reminds me of something like a child would wear, like like a kid in the olden days, or some kind of like floppy bolo tie, he is typically seen more in a trench coat that happens to be purple. Also, if anyone knows what that tie is called, it's like a little bow, but it's like a string. Let me know in the comments. I don't know what that's called. I do not know. The Joker looks less ridiculous and more menacing in modern comics, with the pranks of his earlier days also getting twisted along with his appearance. In more modern comic book tales, Joker has also been particularly terrifying, at one point having removed his face and stapled it back on in Death of the Family in 2011, and at another point sporting his own intimidating Joker-inspired bat suit during Joker War in 2020. Both of these are great looks, but very different looks. <laughs> Number seven, Toad. Toad has also had a lot of different looks throughout the years, with his original one being the most ridiculous. <laughs> and also fitting, but also so ridiculous. But I'd say the real cool thing about Toad is that a lot of the time his outfits actually really reflect how he's feeling inside and his evolution as a character. This is why at first it's really no surprise that Toad basically is dressed up as a court jester in his first appearances. At that time, that was basically what he was, acting as Magneto's often disappointing goon who wanted nothing more than to please his master, but usually kind of failed at doing so. Toad? As time went on, Toad would come to realize that he didn't actually need to settle for Magneto's mistreatment of him and that he was no longer really indebted to Magneto. In various depictions of the character, he'd become somewhat more independent and sometimes a lot more Toad-like in terms of his design. Fox X-Men movies, I'm looking at you. And in terms of his roles, he also even went from being a villain at Magneto's side in the comics to kind of a weird ally of the X-Men when he became the school janitor in Wolverine and the X-Men. Remember when that happened? He also at one point got a flaming tongue. So he's changed a lot. I don't know if I'm as here for the weird green flaming tongue, but I definitely feel like his look is a lot better now than it was before. Also like that he's kind of like a hacker now. I think that's cool. Number six, the Riddler. The Riddler originally looked Jim Carrey levels of Riddler ridiculous when he first appeared in Detective Comics issue 140. And that's not a slight to Jim Carrey, by the way. I still love that version of the Riddler. Just also a side note, when I call things ridiculous or weird, it's not, it's not necessarily an insult coming from me. And while I do have respect for the Riddler's original question mark suit, I don't think it's necessary for him to be covered in question marks so that we know he's the Riddler. He likes riddles. We get it. Riddler has had a ton of redesigns since that first appearance, with a good number of his modern takes being much improved on in comparison. Okay, so not all of the modern takes on the Riddler have been great. See Riddler with his hair shaved into a question mark shaped green mohawk. That was a weird time. But overall, I think we can say we've seen a marked improvement. I also do love the recent redesign with Paul Dano playing the Riddler in the Batman film. I feel like this design for the character was definitely one of the most terrifying looks for him yet, and also fit really well with his origin and his backstory, and just with the overall tone of that film, which takes inspiration from the comics, but very much grounds the character of the Riddler in reality, giving him more power as well in the process. I think. Like when you make it just not about like silly riddles and you make it about like what is the Riddler and why are there riddles and what is this really about? I mean, it's a powerful character. Number five, Cheetah. I mean, the Cheetah outfit has changed a lot since her first appearance, and so has the character. The first Cheetah villain we were ever introduced to in the pages of 1943's Wonder Woman issue number six is no longer the Cheetah we have in comics. Literally. Much has changed about the character, including her identity, her origin, and her overall look and power set. The original Cheetah was Priscilla Rich, a jealous debutante who dressed up in a skin-tight Cheetah onesie. It's a look, I gotta say. Now we have Barbara Minerva as the main cheetah, who instead of dressing up, actually has a humanoid cheetah form, having been transformed basically by a god. Very different looks and takes on this character, but I definitely say that Minerva's is better overall. 
Sorry, Priscilla. It's just cooler. Like, I mean, then you get to actually kind of fight like a cheetah lady, as opposed to just a lady in a cheetah costume. <laughs> Number four, crime syndicate. The crime syndicate have always been cool, but over the years their looks have gotten a lot more detailed, badass, and in some cases, a lot hotter. I'm here for the sexy crime syndicate, I must say. I'm feeling it. The Crime Syndicate are actually one of the earliest villain teams to take on the Justice League, making their first appearance in 1964 in Justice League of America issue number 29. At least the earlier continuity version of that team, that is. Because this is DC we're talking about here, so you know, now we're on Prime Earth and that was before that, but anyways. Back then their outfits were less sleek and more blocky, such was the time. They were also a lot less sexy back then overall as a team, and had a lot less independent flair with their looks being just a little bit more rough and basically similar adaptations of the team members that they were mirroring. I mean, Owlman literally has Batman's look from like the neck down almost exactly, with only the stark owl on his head setting him apart. It's a look. Number three, Kang the Conqueror. Okay, so Kang still looks pretty crazy, even in the comics, but he's come a long way from that wild purple and green eyesore when it comes to his cinematic appearance at least. We saw our first, likely of many, Kangs in the Disney Plus streaming series Loki. Here Kang was played by the amazing Jonathan Majors, and instead of sporting his very blue face and purple helmet, he was dressed simply in a nice purple robe with green tunic, pants, and sandals underneath. A nice nod to the original design while still providing its own unique take on his look, and a take that is quite a bit more sensible and stylish. Still, an air of flamboyance in how he's dressed, but not so over the top that it undermines how intense, inevitable, and intimidating he who remains, aka an alternate Kang, appears to be here. Number 2, Lex Luthor. Lex looks a lot cooler and a lot more dapper in modern comics than his original appearance. Remember when he used to wear a purple suit with green pants? What is it with villains in purple and green? It's especially over at DC. What's going on over there? It's kind of a very shocking combo of colors, especially for someone like Lex. Although I will admit, put it into a mech type suit, gloss it up a bit, and it works a little better for me. I do like it. Lex used to wear this purple suit with straps across over it, and a very Dracula-esque high collar with bright green pants and purple boots. Fortunately, he now more keeps to suit and tie looks, looking a lot more polished and refined, and occasionally mixes in some badass mechanical armor, which makes him look a lot more intimidating than that collar ever did. Number 1, Killmonger. Talk about villains who have seen an upgrade. In Jungle Action issue number 6, we got our first look at Killmonger. I don't even think you'd recognize him today if your main experience with this character came from the Marvel Cinematic Universe film, Black Panther, and Michael B. Jordan's portrayal of him. The original look for Killmonger involved a lot of spikes, as opposed to a lot of horrifying scars. He didn't initially mark himself for his kills, instead, he was just really pointy. He also wore white pants and a red sash, with no shirt initially. We've come a long way since then, with Killmonger having even been to space and back, where he ruled over the Wakandan space empire. And thankfully, his look has changed quite a lot since then. I'm partial to his symbiote look personally. Still a little spiky, but you know, it doesn't overdo it. Nothing wrong with a little bit of spikes, you just don't want to have too many. <laughs> 